to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God. His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. Thank you to the generous underwriters of Sharper Iron, the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. And Luther Classical College, a college for Lutherans by Lutherans, opening in fall 2025. Learn more at lutherclassical.org. On this Thursday, July 13th, we are studying Psalm 62. In today's text, King David prays as he waits patiently for God, who is his salvation, his rock, his fortress, his refuge. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us returning guest, the Reverend Dr. Christian Preuss. Pastor Preuss serves at Mount Hope Lutheran Church and School in Casper, Wyoming. He is also the chairman for the Board of Regents for Luther Classical College. Pastor Preuss, welcome back to Sharp Iron. Glad to be with you. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about how things are going with Luther Classical College, Pastor Preuss. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, we just had our first conference, uh, the Christian Culture Conference. We brought uh, almost 350 people out here to Casper. I shouldn't say we brought them. They came uh, for this wonderful conference. We had some great speakers. Uh, got to see the sites uh, where we're going to build uh, Luther Classical College right here Um Right next to our church, we have uh, 11, soon to be 16 acres uh, here at uh, Mount Hope, where the church is going to, or the uh, college is going to be built. So yeah, great speakers, awesome enthusiasm. Everyone who came was really excited. It was really good to see uh, prospective students also coming. We have uh, well over 100 of those uh, who have signed our pre-admission form. We're really looking forward to a, a classical Lutheran education. Um, and uh, we welcomed on our academic dean, uh, Ryan uh, McPherson. He starts for us August 1st, so it's going to be great having him actually hitting the ground. And, uh, and uh, we also released our academic kind of summation, so people can go online and see what academics are going to look like at Luther Classical College, what's going to be in our curriculum, what they'll be taking. And uh, the full academic catalog will be released uh, by January. Fantastic. Got to be praised for all the work that's being done, and our prayers continue to be with you and the Board of Regents and for Dr. McPherson as he begins his work as well. We have the privilege of studying Psalm 62 today, Pastor Preuss. Before we start particularly on this psalm, talk to us in general about the psalms. How do we approach them and receive them as Christians? So the psalms are the prayer book of the Bible. Um, so it will often happen, as St. Paul says, that you don't even know what you should pray for as you ought. Um, and th that's when the Holy Spirit uh, in Christians is to intercede with prayers that cannot be uttered. And yet the Holy Spirit speaks in the Psalms. And so it often happens uh, for me that I will be going through uh, whatever it is, joy in my life um, or sadness, uh, challenges, and I'll sit down and read the Psalms, and uh, no matter what, it answers. It answers to the heart of the Christian, his needs, um, and uh, the sincere faith in the God of the Bible, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, uh, in particular in his power and in his mercy in, in Jesus Christ. And so for uh, as long as the Psalms have been uh, written for you know, uh, with some of them are well over 3,000 years old. Uh, Christians have been praying these. And that's the other beauty of it, is that we join with what um, we call the Holy Christian Church, which is not just what we see right now, but it is ages of, um, of, of faithful Christians who have prayed these same psalms. We join our voices with them, and it becomes this, this prayer that transcends time. And so the invaluable uh, worth uh, of the Psalms just simply cannot be expressed expressed adequately. Yeah, fan this is a fantastic book, a wonderful resource that we continue to use and pray as Christians. In terms of Psalm 62, what kinds of specifics might we need to know as we approach this Psalm? Yeah, so as we go through this, notice that he asks for nothing. Hmm. And sometimes that is uh, what a prayer is. It's okay. 
uh, if you have uh, nothing exactly to ask for, you do have something to confess. And prayers do uh, both these things or each of these things. And here he is simply expressing his confidence, his confidence in God's word, which is a good thing to announce to God. Right? <laughs> um, so uh, that's, that's one thing uh, to keep in mind as we read this psalm, that he actually requests nothing. The other thing is that he expresses no fear in this psalm. Um, he is totally reliant on God, and fear doesn't come in. Um, in other psalms, it will. Uh, but here, uh, because he is waiting for the Lord, he has no reason to fear. And so it's this beautiful, like, uh, pure expression of faith. Hmm. And also, uh, as far as the inscription of this psalm, uh, to the, the chief musician, to Jeduthun, uh, a psalm of David, um, that uh, David wrote this psalm, King David. Um, so we know when it was written, uh, about a thousand years before Christ, and that he wrote it uh, to the chief musician. I don't know if you were going to ask that, but um, the chief musician, people uh, will either say that this is uh, God himself, which I really love. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Luther would love that too, to say that uh, God himself is the chief musician because he is the creator of music um, and rejoices in it. Or it's some high official uh, whose, uh, whose name uh, would be uh Jeduthun, that is a high official who is supposed to be in charge of music for David. But either way, psalms were meant to be sung. They were meant to be accompanied with with lyre, with music. And uh, it's a beautiful thing when psalms can be sung uh, in the congregational setting or even sung alone. And music stirs the soul. And this Mm. this psalm especially is meant to be sung. Hmm. Yeah, you know, I don't think that I've ever heard anybody suggest, maybe I just haven't been reading the right people, that the as it's translated in the ESV, the choir master, the chief musician would be God himself. But I really like that. Talk a little bit more about what that, I mean, if that's the case, what that opens up for us in the Psalter. Well, it, I think that people view uh, music just as like my preference, right? So I like country and I like rock and roll, and I like Bach. And uh, to a certain extent, it is, it is your preference. That's fine. Um, but there is also an objectivity to music. Music does things to the human soul. And so God created our souls to respond to music in a certain way. And that's why we have, you know, if, if you're wondering why we have, you know, traditional worship in our congregations, why we have the organ playing, um, and why uh, we don't have like uh, a rock and roll band, at least not at my church, it's because we acknowledge this music produces certain um, movements of the soul. And uh, when we understand that music is objective and that God is actually the one uh, who uh, created our souls to respond to music in a certain way, we're going to respect it um, and we're going to uh, join theological language with theological music um, that will not let our emotions sort of like get out of control Um, (laughs) because you can be you can be rocking in your car right and let your music get all or your your emotions get all all out of control because you're um, jamming to boston or something like that right and if you notice like if you go through the hymnal or even if you go through the psalm tones in in the lutheran service book they'll never let you do that they'll never let you get to that just like height of emotion where you're just screaming and letting it all out because music is about uh not it's also about controlling and taming and moving your emotions so that they're in line with god's word Hmm. um and so uh the psalms of course traditionally have been uh, chanted, um, and they allow emotions to come out, uh, and emotions should come out, Christian emotions, but in such a way that they keep the reverence toward God, um, and that they keep the, the doctrine, the truth of what of God's Word in front of us. Hmm. Yeah, I think that the Psalter especially does have a, a way of keeping our emotions 
under God. The, the ministerial use of emotion, maybe, is the way to, to think about it. Like we talk about the ministerial use of reason, that our reason is a servant of the text. So our emotions should be a servant of the text as well. And the Psalms and music as well can very much help with that. Absolutely. That's a great way of putting it. All right. So let's take a look at this text from Psalm 62. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. How long will all of you attack a man to batter him, like a leaning wall, a tottering fence? They only plan to thrust him down from his high position. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence. For my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances they go up. They are together lighter than a breath. Put no trust in extortion. Set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God, and that to you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love, for you will render to a man according to his work. That's the text for today. That is Psalm 62. Pastor Price, you've already given us some of the overarching themes here in this psalm. How would you structure this psalm? How do you see it dividing up into to stanzas or sections? It uh, breaks up into an introduction, and then you have uh, a conclusion. So the uh, introduction is 1 and 2, and then the conclusion is 11 and 12. Um, so you have those sections. Then uh, in the body itself, um, he addresses uh, the evil man um, who assault his, uh, assault his life, uh, and that is verses 3 and 4. Then, then he addresses God and repeats what he says in verses 1 and 2, that his soul waits for God uh, and talks about him. Um, and then he addresses in verse, in verse 8, which can, can just like be by itself, he addresses all of us. Trust in him at all times, you people. In other words, he says, um, what I have just been confessing belongs to all Christians. And then 9 and 10 uh, is uh, the the reason uh, for um, not trusting in anybody but God. Mm. All right, so verses 1 and 2 serve as an introduction, and then do get a, a bit of a repeat, almost like a refrain in the middle. Mm-hmm. Help us into what is, what's being confessed there in verses 1 and 2. Yeah, so waiting uh, for God in silence, uh, that is, this is complete, completely passive uh, behavior. Um, it is contemplation on his word, and it is realizing that there is absolutely nothing that I can do uh, without, uh, without God. And so, um, especially toward my salvation. And so it's a, it's a beautiful confession of uh, what we call divine monergism. Um, and that is that God only is the one who works to convert us and to keep us in the one true Christian faith. Um, this brings us back to Psalm 46, which is uh, the theme psalm for a mighty fortress is our God, uh, where uh, God comes out and says, be still and know that I am God. Uh, in other words, at a certain point, you just have to Stop your work, stop all of your strivings, and uh, let God uh, li- listen to God's word um, and let God do the work in. The evangelicals say, let go and let God, which, you know, uh, as, long as, you, as long as you explain it theologically well, uh, even though uh, all of these cliches can be used over and over again and get sickening, is, is pretty much true. That's that's not the motto for Luther Classical College, is it? No, no, it's not. <laughs> we we don't we don't do cliches like that. We're classical, <laughs> you know. 
<laughs> that's right. That's right. Okay. But but as you said, rightly understood, there's there's something there for us. It, it's striking that both in verses one and two, it's for God alone, He only the the absolute. I mean, you you said divine monergism mm-hmm. that that God alone is the one who can accomplish these things for David. Yeah, and I think that. Uh, we, we apply this specifically to our salvation. We're, of course, synergists when it comes to like um, our daily lives, right? God works together with us. We work together with God. Um, it's not like God forces me to give my kids a kiss goodnight. Um, I actually do that. I exert my will. Um, and yes, uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit, um, do I love others with the love of Christ. However, uh, David has seen also, even in his ruling his kingdom, right? Even in political matters, even with his family, uh, he has seen uh, sort of the vanity of man's work. Um, It's like, unless uh, God builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. I mean, this this is the principle. David is a king. He's seen all sorts of things. He's, he's ruled well. He's tried to make good judgments. And he's seen that in the end, it's only God's will that is going to work. And we can strive for the good, and we should strive for the good. Uh, but in the end, uh, you have to simply wait for God and his goodness and trust that his will is good. Hmm. Talk about the, the role of waiting, of patience within the life of the Christian. It seems like that's a, an admonition to the Christian all the time in the Scriptures. Why is that such an important part of the Christian life? Yeah, the the compulsion of sin is I want it and I want it now, right? And that is actually to make ourselves God. That is to say, I want it on my terms and in my time. Um, and even if it's a good thing, uh, God uh, will make us uh, wait for it in order uh, to test us and to... Um, increase and strengthen what he knows is uh, a far greater treasure in us, and that is that is faith. Um, so if God gives us instantly everything that we want, um, then he knows what will happen, and that is that we will uh, rejoice in the gifts instead of the giver. Um, he, just, he simply knows uh, man's nature, and he knows it better than we do. And so it is a, a good thing, it's a beautiful thing for God to say, um, no, I'm not going to give you this at this time. You do have to wait. Um, and I know you want a good thing, but uh, trust in me, I will give it. And what your eyes can't see now, uh, you will see. Um, this also keeps our, because our greatest goal is actually the things that we can't see. This is what St. Paul makes very clear. Um, so we can't see Christ right now. And yet Christ is our treasure. He's our goal. Um, our goal is to see him face to face, period. Um, and since the things that are not seen are our greatest treasure, that means that our greatest treasure is something that we have to wait for. And so for God to train us in other things to wait, right, uh, makes us better at waiting for heaven and expecting it. Um, it's far too easy, especially in our time, to get, um, I suppose, weighed down with the joys of this world. I mean, I have a lot of joys in life. I have nine beautiful children. I have a wife. I have a mountain in my backyard. Um, I have, uh, and and besides, you know, just the joys of food and exercise and wine and whatever it is, and God wants us to enjoy these things. Um, But if he doesn't make us wait uh, for for, for blessings, we can simply just be... uh, Grow to, grow to ignore him, and especially to not want to leave this earth, to not want something that is actually better, to not look forward to heaven. It's very interesting when you read the Lutherans, say, of the 16th century or the 17th century in their devotional work, they are constantly talking about the expectation of heaven. And they'll speak in ways that I find almost uncomfortable because they, they'll be like, I can't wait till I leave this miserable, horrible existence. And like, wait a second, that doesn't speak to me. I've been pretty happy this last week. Uh, but, but the fact is, is that God gave them all sorts of crosses. And like the mortality rate was horribly high. Most of these men and women lost children, lost husbands, lost wives. 
um, themselves, you know, they went through uh, more pain as far as physical pain without antibiotics and modern medicine and so forth. And they saw with their own eyes uh, very often and, and in their own experience, just the pain of this life. And they looked forward to a life that was free from sin and its corruption. And very often we can mask that for ourselves and that's dangerous. So when God uh, makes us wait for a good thing, when he makes us suffer, uh, he does so for our good because he knows he, he, has, he has our eternal life in mind. He has an eternal perspective, an eternal good for us that we might not be able to see in the moment. Hmm. Uh, and with that talk of waiting, then notice what or upon whom for what David waits. He, he doesn't wait for anything but God. He is waiting for God himself, not for, for all the things or, or any, any such blessing, just to be with God, to wait on God. That's the one on whom he's waiting. And he calls God several things within these verses, a lot of imagery, as you said, connections to Psalm 46. Talk about some of the imagery that gets used here. God is my rock, my salvation, my fortress. Mm-hmm. So the rock is that which you build the house on, right? It's the foundation upon which everything else uh, must stand. This is what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, that uh, this is to end his famous Sermon on the Mount, where he says, if you build uh, your, the foolish man is the one who builds his house on, on the sand, and the wind comes and the waves come, and it strikes uh, that house and it falls, and great is its fall. But the house that stands on the rock, and that is Jesus, that is God, that is his word, um, stands and it can withstand, uh, it, it stands on that foundation and therefore it, it, it can withstand all of the, the wind and the waves uh, of life, uh, which are not just um, the pains of this life, um, as in like physical p- pains and, and, and psychological distresses, but also the pains of uh, false doctrine, um, false belief. Uh, which you find uh, very often in the scriptures, winds and billows actually referring to uh, false teaching, things that will uh, make you stray from the way. Here in Wyoming, we're very familiar with wind. It's a very uh, windy place in the, in the winter, at least. Right now, we're getting a respite. Uh, and you will literally sometimes be walking and, and, and lose your way because of the wind. Like, it will... Um, if you're not expecting it, they call it the Casper lean. Hmm. So if you're not, if, you, if you're not <laughs> leaning into the wind, right. Um, uh, you're going to, you're going to go astray. And that's, that's what false God, uh, the, a false gospel, false doctrine can do. So built on, on the rock. And then you have, uh, God as uh, a fortress. And, and once again, we're not just talking about, um, we're not just talking about, uh, physical, ills but false doctrine the fiery darts of the devil to temptations um so if you think about what a fortress was used for it's it's a high place um and it's where you can actually defend yourself uh against uh an enemy that is coming coming at you uh with arrows uh with uh with violence in order to uh take you and to take uh, those you love and so uh the fortress is the protection from uh, the devil and everything uh, evil to both body uh, and soul. Hmm. And what about the term "my salvation" that he uses? That's one I think that we we see regularly in the scriptures. Sometimes we skip over it. What does that entail? Well, so sal- salvation is a broader term than say like justification. Justification has only uh, to to do with the declaration of uh, a sinner as righteous, and that. Um, that is the core of salvation, but salvation belongs to both body and soul. That in the end is what we pray in the seventh petition of the Lord's Prayer. God would deliver us from every evil of body and soul. Um, and this is done, um, as we confess in the third article of the Creed, through his holy Christian church, um, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the life everlasting. We could throw the resurrection of the body in there also. Um, so in the end, uh, God is his salvation, not just temporarily, but, but temporarily also. <laughs> he's, his, he's his salvation. He's his, he's his help uh, from all evil right now and always. 
uh, and these things are interconnected. So he's, he, he is uh, confessing there uh, a faith in, eternal, in an eternal life, but also a faith in uh, the eternal life that's now lived as God's child. And this is, by the way, a, a beautiful mark of the true Christian faith uh, and the way God speaks is that he talks about salvation more than he talks about, say, growth, right? Like, um, it's not as if our problem in life is that we just haven't reached a perfection that we need to reach, right? And so he's going to help us along the way, and he's going to give us more and more uh, of his grace so that we can we can reach that perfection. It's rather we actually have things that we need saving from, right? There, are, there is there is a corruption in my flesh that I need saving from. I have enemies, uh, and and God has enemies, right? Who uh, teach against His word. There are temptations. There is the devil. All of these things I actually need saving from. And so, whenever we are talking about salvation, we're not just talking about um, hey, at the end of your, you know, nice suburban life um, as a middle class American, you also get to go to heaven. Uh, we're t- <laughs> we're talking about God actually saving us from real evils that are presently in our life, uh, and those in- th- those are what are um, summarized right by Martin Luther um, as as uh, the devil, the world, and our own sinful flesh. And uh, a, a beautiful thing that uh, we should do often is read Luther's 10, or sorry, 20 uh, questions and answers before communion. Uh, at mm-hmm. the end there, when it says, the last question is, what should a person do uh, if he feels no hunger and thirst for the sacrament? In other words, if he feels no hunger and thirst for salvation from evil. And the answer is that he should uh, touch his breast and see if he still is made of flesh and blood. And believe what the Bible says about it, and he should look around to see whether he is still in the world. <laughs> and then uh, he should know that the devil is always about him, with his lying and murdering, who will, who will let him have no uh, rest, either within or without. And so, God is my salvation. He saves me from everything evil, and that means that evil things are actually there, and God is fighting against them for me. Mm, yeah, and he is the only one who can give this salvation, and so it is for God alone that we wait with King David. We're going to keep looking at Psalm 62 on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron on a KFUO. We're talking to Pastor Christian Preuss this morning. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Did you know that Lutherans are helping new American immigrants get settled? How about struggling church workers in need of support and refreshment? And we assist at-risk children and provide disaster response to hurricane victims. Through LCMS recognized service organizations, we are doing all this and more. I'm Rahema Kavuga of Lutheran Church Extension Fund, and I don't want you to miss out on hearing what your brothers and sisters in Christ are up to. Visit interesttime.org to see how your support gives life to these works of mercy and love. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Thursday, July 13th. We're studying Psalm 62 with Pastor Christian Price. He serves at Mount Hope Lutheran Church and School in Casper, Wyoming. Pastor Price, prior to the break, we looked at the first two verses which introduce this psalm. In verse 3, then, David now begins to speak to enemies, it sounds like. How long will all of you attack a man to batter him? like a leaning wall, a tottering fence. Take us into this next part of Psalm 62. Yeah, so here is uh, what we were talking about before the break, is um, that there are actual enemies, and uh, sometimes these uh, enemies are uh, uh, spiritual enemies, right? Uh, Demons, uh, temptations of our own flesh. Um, And you are are absolutely um, invited by God's word. Um, to see these enemies as spiritual enemies, um, especially if you are not currently being attacked, uh, you know, by some guy with a uh, with a knife. Um, but there are also physical enemies. Um, so when he says, "How long will you uh, attack a man?" Um, uh, he is uh, 
most likely referring to people who are actually going after his life. However, when you go into the next verse, you see that they delight in lies, that they bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. So he goes after their, their hypocrisy, um, that uh, they'll flatter him and, yet, um, and, and say nice things to his face, and yet they are dishonest and they're uh, deceptive and they're slandering him behind his back. And so once again, you can, um, this is really inclusive of all of the sorts of threats and enemies that a Christian is going to face. If you think about it in terms of like the Ten Commandments, um, and you go from the Fourth Commandment, the Fifth Commandment, the Sixth Commandment, Seventh Commandment, and so forth, um, there's a lot of ways that we can be we can be hurt. Our reputation can be can be hurt, um, and our body can be hurt. But then when you look at the uh, first three commandments, uh, our our soul can be hurt. Right by the uh, teaching of false doctrine, and so uh, th- this again is the beauty and the versatility of the psalm: is that whatever you're actually going through, whatever you're being attacked with at the time, you can pray this psalm and see that this psalm responds to the enemy, uh, whether that's the enemy of a uh, temptation to sin, or it's the en- it's or if it's some sort of political enemy right, Um, who is persecuting the Christian church, Um, or whether it is um, uh, the slander of enemies against the Christian church, uh, so forth and so on. It applies uh, in all those ways. Mm. Well, talk more about the the primary weapon that David does identify here, the the falsehood, the lies, the inward cursing, the, the duplicity. On the one hand, they're blessing, but inwardly they're cursing. Talk more about the role of the of speech, of words here in this this warfare that's being described. Yeah, so words, what is it, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me, is uh, just not true. Um, wor- <laughs> words, words are the most powerful thing in the world, and you wouldn't even need God's word to tell you that, um, but God's word does tell you it all the time. Words uh, are how God created the world. Uh, Jesus himself is uh, called, is named the Word. He is the communication of God to us. And so words are actually a divine thing. They come from God himself. He is the great communicator. Um, And then the manipulation of words then in order to try, uh, in order to be gods ourselves and use words in order to uh, manipulate reality. Um, That's what a lie is, is to use words in order to manipulate our own reality, to create our own reality, which isn't the true one, is our usurpation of God's work. So if you think about this, God creates everything, he runs everything, he orders everything, and he even saves us uh, by his word. Um, And God himself is the word, right, who communicates God's love to us by his incarnation, by his death for us on the cross, by his shedding of his blood. And so when we then use words in order to, uh, or when evil people, I should say, we can apply it to ourselves also, use words in order to manipulate reality, to say things that are untrue of God's world and of God himself, uh, what we are doing is uh, is uh, asserting for ourselves this role of creator, and there is nothing uh, really worse than that. That is that that is uh, the definition of idolatry. It's what it's exactly what the devil does in the garden uh, with Eve. Says uh, that uh, you know God did God really say? But then uh, when Eve says, "Yeah, yeah," he says that. <laughs> he says. Um, God knows that if you eat of the tree, then you will be like him, knowing good and evil. That is, you get to discern, you get to decide what is good and evil now, right? You get to actually be a creator yourself. You're going to be like God. You get to create your own reality. And so when people use words in our day, and this is, this is the philosophy of the day, this is what the enemies of the Christian church are doing right now. They always have, but it's very obvious in our day. When they use words in order to undercut the reality that God has made, uh, it hurts. 
it hurts real people who were actually made to live in the real reality, which was created by God's word and is structured by real, true words. So an instance of that would be the redefinition of, of marriage that hurts people. Um, the pandemic of uh, no-fault divorce that hit our country uh, in the 60s and 70s, uh, the pandemic now of, um, which, which by the way, the pandemic of no-fault divorce that hit our country, which uh, made divorce rates skyrocket. Uh, mm. the, uh, this uh, hurts people because it defines marriage in, in, in a different way. Marriage is no longer a lifelong union between a, a man and a woman, right? It is a temporary one that you can get out of that contract uh, easier than you can get out of a car contract or a house contract. It's the cheapest contract known to man once you get no-fault divorce. So words matter. Uh, and once marriage doesn't mean marriage anymore, uh, then that actually forms a reality that actually affects people. Then kids grow up in broken homes. They don't have a daddy and so forth and so on. And then people don't trust marriage anymore at all. They don't think it's a concept worthy of respect. And so they don't get married themselves. And uh, so that most uh, most kids nowadays are born in the United States are born outside of wedlock and therefore uh, very often without fathers, which is a leading cause of crime, a leading cause of uh, use of drugs, leading cause of depression, leading cause of you name it. Uh, so you, what, my point here is that the redefining of a word using words ends up having real life obvious consequences. So when David um, is fighting for the Lord God of Israel and insisting on his holy word and the messianic promises and his word about marriage, his word uh, against um, abortion, right? Against the God Moloch and so forth. His enemies are the ones coming in and trying to change reality by changing the way people speak. Instead of saying God, you say gods, right? You just turn it into the plural. Instead of saying, Lord, you say Baal or Lord and Baal, right? Um, yeah. so, so words create a reality. The question is whether it's God's reality or not. Mm. Yeah, which is why Christians then confess. We speak what God has spoken first. Rather than attempting to create our own reality with our words, we let God's words define that reality, and we simply speak what he has spoken. So in, in the face of these words that would lie, then, David finds his refuge in God, the one who speaks. In verses 5 to 7, we come back to that introduction, very similar to what was spoken in verses 1 and 2. There's a few things that are added. I, I notice he, he calls, he speaks about his hope, he speaks about uh, his, his glory. Take us into verses 5 through 7. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. Um, that uh, because it's God who makes reality, we just have to be silent and let His Word do the work. Right? That's the point. Right? That's why He says, "I just wait in silence. I'm going to let God speak the words. This isn't my word; it's His word. So He gets to do the judging." Um, uh, the uh, the difference. Uh, that I wanted to actually focus on in these ones is how he talks about uh, refuge, that God is a refuge mm -hmm. for us. Yeah. Um, and that, is, and that, that, that moves with hope and so forth, um, the, and, 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 and even glory. Um, but the refuge uh, brings to mind uh, this, the, the cities of refuge, mm -hmm. where uh, people who were guilty of manslaughter could flee. And as long as they were in that city of refuge in Israel, I mean, these cities existed. They were there. People knew them, right? And so when, they're, when, they're, they, when they see this word refuge, they're, uh, they're going to uh, probably be thinking about these cities also, where you can run and never be punished then for your well, unintentional sin, right? For bloodshed and so forth. And as long as you're in that city, you are simply protected. God says, um, you can't touch him. And uh, when you're talking about the enemies of God's word, the comfort of running to a refuge, that is where God is going to, a place, an actual place where God is going to protect you from your enemies, um, is reminds us of the Holy Christian Church, that there is actually a place that you can go, where there are other Christians, where the word of God is taught, 
where God's man who has been called by God preaches God's word to you with the body and blood of Christ are distributed to you for the forgiveness of your sins um, and where the world can't touch you, right? As long as, long as you, you, you're silent and you listen <laughs> to, the, to the words uh, of God. Hmm. Absolutely beautiful there that my refuge is God, as David confesses there in verse 7. In verse 8, then, he calls upon others to join him in this faith. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. This isn't David's faith only. He, he is recalling the whole Christian church here. Yeah, that's why we pray our Father, even when we're alone. We pray our Father, because we're always part of the Holy Christian Church. In America, we love to make uh, religion just about me and God, and um, my individual experience with God. And of course, you have an individual experience with God. He is your God. Um, that's how this psalm starts, right? My, you, you are my salvation. Um, however, we should never um, act as if uh, we, we are alone in this world. That would be, that'd be a very um, uncomforting thing also right so elijah says i'm alone i'm the only one left they've killed everybody else and god reminds him that seven thousand have not uh, bowed the knee to Baal, and it, it remains the same now and this is why especially here in america where people think that they can be christians and not go to church um i suppose that's theoretically possible that you could have faith in jesus and not go to church you'd be disobeying jesus um because he tells you to go to church uh, but the, the real point there is, why would you not want to be with your fellow uh, brothers and sisters in Christ? Why wouldn't, uh, uh, I mean, to, to see, right, that there is an actual body, an actual family uh, that believes what you believe, uh, that has been, um, that has been uh, converted by the same spirit who has moved your heart. It's a beautiful, wonderful, awesome thing. And we should, we should realize that. The other thing here is that, um, a lot has happened to David, and he has, um, God has overcome it in his life by the preaching of the gospel, by the preaching of Christ crucified, by the promises given to him, and um, by all sorts of other, um, uh, you know, faithful experiences that David has had. And St. Paul gives us this, uh, this beautiful um, admonition or confession in Second Corinthians, where he says, uh, we have gone through all sorts of trials and God has helped us through these, the God of comfort, he calls him, so that we are able to comfort those who go through like trials. And we have to realize this as Christians that uh, just as David went through these trials and God helped him through them by the preaching of the gospel, so also God gives us trials and it's never just because um, he needs, well, it's very often not simply because he, he wants to test our faith. It's also because in the end, we're going to be able to comfort others with the comfort by which we have been comforted. And that's exactly what uh, uh, David does here. Yeah, I mean, as, as you pointed out toward the very beginning, David does not ask for anything within this psalm. And yet, in that faith, he now is encouraging all those other Christians, hey, pour out your heart before the Lord. Do not be afraid to petition him. Even though David has no particular petition here, within this confidence that he has at this moment to simply confess his faith, he is urging his fellow Christians to pray and to, to call out to God in their time of need. Yeah, and this, uh, don't, yeah, don't think that this doesn't apply to you. Like, um, I've seen this in my congregation a lot. The more people sing, um, the more people, uh, more the, the more it encourages others to sing, and this can even work with like the confession of um, the Nicene Creed uh, or the Apostles' Creed, whatever creed you're confessing on a Sunday morning, um, and and people are just mumbling it and not paying attention. It doesn't inspire anything, but when you actually confess it and see other Christians doing it, it's uh, it's it's a beautiful it's a, it's it's a beautiful uh, inspiration to others, and the whole body grows. What is David teaching in verses 9 and 10? So surely men of low degree are a vapor. I've got the New King James here. I was looking for the ESV. I'm sorry. I couldn't find it That's on my fine. desk. <laughs> uh, men of high degree are a lie. If they're weighed on the scales, they are altogether lighter than vapor. Um, so again, this is his 
his assessment, it's actually his, uh, his son's assessment after him, right? Solomon, yeah. the entire book of uh, Ecclesiastes is written about this, um, that trust in man is obvious and, and, and of uh, earthly things is obviously uh, vanity because in the end, they can't give you the help that you actually need. The, uh, as St. Augustine said, uh, you created us, O God, for yourself, and our souls are restless until they find their rest in you. And they're not actually going to find rest in riches, right, of this world. They're not going to find rest in enough wine. You know, Solomon tried it all. Um, and David pretty much did too. So I was like, you know, maybe, maybe if I have enough gardens, uh, so I'll build these beautiful gardens. No, that doesn't make me happy. And then maybe if I have enough wives. No, that definitely didn't work. Um, so forth and so on. Uh, he cannot find satisfaction in life except for when finally he relies on God. And that's, that's, that's the conclusion. Uh, and, and here's God's word, which offers um, what our, the human soul simply longs for, even if it doesn't know it. Uh, and that is communion with its maker, which can only happen through the blood of Christ and through the word uh, of his spirit. Um, also, though, here, uh, David is talking about his ex experience uh, with rich men and poor men. So you have men of low degree, then you have men of high degree. Um, and it doesn't matter uh, whether they've, uh, they, they seem to be able to help you in uh, you know, monetary matters and so forth. Once again, it can only be a temporary help, right? Uh, and so you better, since it's a transient help, you should only put transient trust in it, right? right. <laughs> uh, but you yeah. put your eternal trust in the God who can actually give you eternal salvation. Hmm. So low degree, high degree, money, riches, these things are only transient. The only eternal hope, salvation, rock, refuge, that is the Lord. David then brings the psalm to conclusion in verses 11 and 12. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God, and that to you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love, for you will render to a man according to his work. Help us into this conclusion of Psalm 62. Yeah, I love this. This is a beautiful use of, of rhetoric where he says, God has spoken once, twice I have heard this. Um, he obviously doesn't mean that he's only heard it twice. Um, what he's saying is uh, repetition is the mother of, of learning. And this is simply how uh, the, Christian, uh, the, the Christian lives with God. He's constantly learning over and over and over again, uh, confidence in God because God continues to speak. So it's not like I heard once upon a time that Jesus died to take away my sins, and so I'm good for the rest of my life. Uh, it's rather that uh, I have to hear it over and over and over and over again, and it never stops, and I don't want it to stop uh, because I need to hear uh, the, the truth of this way, so that in times also of temptation or in times of joy, I don't lose myself, uh, but rather uh, can, uh, can know and be certain uh, that God himself is the powerful one, and to him belongs mercy. So he's the one I should actually trust in. Um, so this, this reminds us to be in the word constantly, to be reading uh, the Bible uh, as much as we can at home, um, and also to be going to church uh, faithfully and, and, and actually hungering and thirsting uh, for the Lord's body and blood. Yeah, um, just to... to if I can just briefly on that, I think that fits this idea of once God has spoken, twice I've heard this, the importance of listening to God's word fits in very well with what we were talking about earlier about the use of words and the importance of simply listening to God. And you know, what James writes in, as in chapter one, you know, be slow to speak, quick to listen, and especially when God's the one talking. So if God says it once, you listen to it twice. There God you says go. it Two times, listen, four. I mean, you know, just the, that importance of, of, again, hearing what God has said, letting him do the speaking, and then echoing back, confessing what he has said. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, I tell this, uh, uh, that Jesus, Jesus says the words of institution four times in the New Testament. He says, this is my body four times. And he does that on purpose, right? If, yeah. if you only said it once, then yeah, I don't know, 
twice, three, four times. Come on. Uh, he, he means it. He really does mean That's it. Exactly right. Uh, so, so listen up. But also, uh, yeah, to, to realize what you just said, that the power of words and words shape our um, conception of reality. And so let's just, we, we could take an example of this. Um, what is, how do people talk? How do people talk in normal, everyday life about the goal of your life? What do they assume about it? What do they say? When they say, uh, what are you going to be when you grow up? What answer do they expect? Well, it's obviously they, they expect something of a career, whether you're a man, a woman, doesn't matter, right? Um, and yet, if you were to ask that question in a Christian context, the answer would be, well, I want to be a Christian. I want to stay a Christian. I want to be faithful. And you might even say, I want to be a father. I want to be a mother. You, you go to the estates, right, that God has actually instituted. And because that's the way the Bible talks. And the more we hear God talk, the more we're going to actually talk the way God talks in a world that simply doesn't talk that way. And that can be very difficult for us, um, including, you know, people like me who are, I mean, I consider myself very conservative, very conservative uh, Lutheran, Bible believing. I read the Bible often, but I will still run into words of God where I'm like, ah, I'm un- <laughs> you can't say that, God, not out loud, right? But of course he can. Yes, it's his word. And I need to learn to be comfortable with that and not with my own flesh or the society around me. That's right. That's right. Speaking of words of God that might make us uncomfortable, the very last, <laughs> the very last phrase of this psalm might make some Lutherans uncomfortable. How, how do we understand the last part of, of Psalm 62, verse 12, for you will render to a man according to his work? I have no idea. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> he's, he says... Also to you, O Lord, belongs mercy. And then he says, for you render to each one according to his work. Now, we glory in the fact that our God shows mercy, period. That's, I mean, God is love. He is mercy. It is our hope. It is our, our, our one confidence in life because we are sinners. And without his mercy in Christ Jesus and the blood shed for us, we would be doomed. So how then can he say, for you render to each one according to his work. And there's two things that we should uh, point out here. One is just realize what the context is, and that is that those who have been uh, rendering to David in this psalm um, are the enemies of God, and they've been rendering lies, right? And they've been, li- and they've been rendering persecution that David as a Christian who is redeemed by the blood of Christ, or will be redeemed at this time because Jesus hasn't come and died yet, but G- uh, David as a Christian, redeemed by the blood of Christ, um, has been relieved from all punishment. He's been relieved from uh, persecution, right? He does not deserve this. That's the point. Because he is righteous and holy before God by faith in Jesus Christ. And so the persecutors of David have been rendering to him, not according to his work, not according to his desert because he's a Christian, but rather according to their own, uh, their own desires, um, and their own, um, you know, lying, uh, conception of reality. Uh, the second thing to realize here is that Jesus talks this way. It's actually in the Athanasian creed. Um, so that in the end, Jesus will come and he will judge and he will give to those who have done good everlasting life. Um, And you also have Jesus pointing to people's works in Matthew chapter 25 and saying, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was naked, you gave me clothing, so forth and so on. So Jesus does point to work, uh, point to to the works of Christians. Uh, But he does so always in recognition that the only way you do good works is if you're already a Christian. Sons do the work of sons. Daughters do the work of daughters. They don't earn anything by these things. But I render to my son the things that are due him as a son because he's my son. Right? Um, So if somebody, take it this way. If somebody comes and mows my lawn for me, I might give him 20 bucks. If my son mows my lawn for me, I will render to him according to his work and I will hug him. And say, I love you, David. Thanks. Now go take a shower, right? Because he's my son. So you deal with different people differently. And God renders to each one according to his work. If you're a non believer, he'll give you the payment that you deserve, which is hell. And 
if you are a Christian, he'll give you the payment that is due his sons and his, and his daughters, which is a hug, right? And an embrace and a kiss and say, welcome to the feast. Let's eat. Yep. Yeah, that's right. And even, I mean, within the context of the psalm, as you brought out, what the enemies are being are rendering to David, look at the context of what David's doing in this psalm. He's trusting, he's waiting, he's sitting there in silence for his father to embrace him with that love. And and indeed, that is what the Father does for his Christians. Pastor Christian Preuss serves at Mount Hope Lutheran Church and School in Casper, Wyoming. He's also the chairman for the Board of Regents of Luther Classical College. He's been helping us today to study Psalm 62. Pastor Preuss, thanks for being our guest today. Thank you, Pastor Apple. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. If you have any questions about Psalm 62, send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. It's always a joy to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow. Tomorrow.